Hi there! So I'm going to read book number three from Magic Hoofbeats, Horse Tales from Many Lands. This is a Barefoot Books book and I have permission from the publisher to read it. These are um, st old stories that are retold by Josepha Sherman and illustrated by Linda Wingerter. The story that I'm going to read to you today is uh, story number three. It's called the Basque. It's from the Basque country, which is um, land that um, falls between um, France and Spain. And this story is called the Podic Pony. Sorry, there's a beautiful illustration. These books are really beautiful. The Basque region is a rugged, mountainous area stretching from the southwest of France across the Pyrenees to northern Spain. This area of Europe is famous for the Podic, an ancient breed of small horse that can be found with just slight variations in Poland, Portugal, and Spain. Although no one is sure of the true origins of the Podic, this friendly and hardworking mountain pony is probably a direct descendant of the prehistoric horses that are represented on the cave wall drawings of Lasco, Cumbarellis, and Isturiz in France, and Altamira in Spain. Nowadays, podic ponies are brown and black, and some scientists believe they took on this coloring after the ice age, after the last ice age, when warmer weather and higher rainfall led to the growth of richer vegetation and forests. These camouflage colors would have helped the horses to escape predators. In the latter centuries, podic ponies became an indispensable part of traditional Basque life, working underground in the mountain mines and above ground as pack animals, helping to transport goods to and fro across the mountains. Small, stocky, and even tempered, they were easy to train and dependable to work with. However, as the mountain regions became steadily more populated with small farming communities and villages, the ponies were driven into more barren areas higher up in the hills. As recently as the 1950s, groups of wild ponies could be found running free in the isolated mountain areas. Nowadays, they are rounded up once a year in early January, branded, and either released again or sold on as breeding stock. Since the late 1970s, they have been increasing demand. There, they, there has been an increasing demand in riding animals, and their calm nature and small size has made them very popular as mounts for children. Podic ponies also perform well as show jumpers, in the dressage arena, and in harness. Some believe that podic ponies were taken to the New World by Spanish navigators during the 16th and 17th centuries. If this is the case, the podic are at least in part the ancestors of the horses of North America. Since horses have been such a valuable asset to the Basque people for centuries, beyond telling, it is no surprise that a magical white mare becomes the protectress of the heroine in this folktale. A white horse would have been a rarity among the podic, so the fact that this mare is white gives her a numinous and otherworldly quality. So this story is called The White Mare, and it's Basque. Once there lived a king with three daughters. The youngest was named Fifine, and she was his favorite since she was kind and good of heart. Now, one day, the king was sitting peacefully with his daughters when he felt something tickle his ear. What's this? he cried. Fifine looked and pounced. A flea, she said, holding it between her thumb and forefinger. But it's larger than any normal flea. Sure enough, it was. Curious, the king had put it in a container so that it could be studied. But the flea grew so quickly and swiftly that it outgrew the container. The king had placed it in a barrel, but the flea grew swiftly. The flea grew so swiftly that it quickly outgrew the barrel, and now it was as large as a cow. That's large enough, the king decided, and he had the flea slain and its skin tanned, just as though it had really been a cow. And since he had been a fanciful, he had a fanciful turn of mind, the king issued a proclamation. Whoever could name the animal that had provided this skin should have one of his three princesses as his bride. Of course, the king never expected anyone to be able to guess. For long and long again, no would-be suitor succeeded. But one day, a prince arrived, a fine fellow in shining golden armor. Your majesty, he said, that is the skin of a flea grown in a barrel. So it was. The king relieved that the winner of the contest, contest should be a prince, and a golden prince at that, told him to step forth and pick one of the three princesses for his bride. So I shall, the golden prince agreed, in two days. The entire royal palace was in a stir, as can be imagined. Everyone wanted to prepare 
as fine a feast for the golden prince as had ever been seen. Only Fifine wasn't happy. She went down to the royal stables to the stall of her favorite mare, the white, her favorite horse, the white mare. Be wary, the white mare warned her. That is not truly a prince, but an evil spirit, and, if he, and he intends to choose you. I must warn my father. He will not believe you. No one in the entire palace will believe you. The golden prince will see to that. And once the golden prince has chosen you, we shall never be free. What can I do? Listen to me and heed my words. Your father will wish to give you a fine wedding present. Refuse anything he offers. Tell him that you want nothing but the white mare. You must not leave the palace without me, and you must be riding me when you go. Fifine left the stable with a heart full of grief. She borrowed ugly clothes from a servant and went to meet the golden prince with her hair dirty and, her, and full of ashes, but he only smiled. I choose you, Princess Fifine, for my bride. Everyone rejoiced, everyone but Fifine. Sure enough, after the feast, her father said, Come, my dear, I will give you a fine wedding present. I want only the white mare, she replied. What? A mangy old horse? Nonsense. I will give you 50 bags of gold. All I want is the white mare. You cannot have the white mare, the king exclaimed. She belongs to your poor dead mother. I will not let the white mare go. You can see there's a beautiful picture of Fifine. You can see how beautiful she is, even though she's wearing rags. Then the golden prince may not wed me. I will not leave here until I may leave riding the white mare. What could her father do? He didn't want to lose so fine and shining a son-in-law. At last he muttered, very well, you may have the white mare. The golden prince frowned. Such an ugly horse. We shall tie it behind my carriage so that no one can see it. But Fifine remembered the white mare's warning. Oh, that won't do. My white mare is so swift that she can outrun all your carriage horses. We shall ride on in front and you shall follow. With that, Fifine threw herself onto the white mare's back, and the white mare sped off like lightning. The golden prince swore an angry oath and whipped his carriage horses after them. White mare, white mare, they're gaining, Fifine gasped. Not for long, the white mare replied. She stopped short and struck the earth three times with a hoof, so strongly that the earth rang. And a great abyss opened before her. Enter, evil one, the white mare cried. Enter and stay for seven years. With that, the carriage, golden prince, and all flew down into the abyss, and the earth closed over them. We're safe, Fifine gasped. Only for seven years, the white mare corrected her. I could not provide you with safety forever, she sighed. The world is a wide and dangerous place for a pretty young princess alone, so I shall disguise you as a young prince. This sounded splendid to Fifine, who had never seen the wide world beyond the palace. She traveled on in her magical disguise, her only companion, the white mare, and many sights, both good and ill, did she see. At last, weary from their journeying, she came to a great palace. This is a good place for us to stop, the white mare said. The queen who rules has a son who is as kind as he is handsome, but you not, must not tell anyone yet that you are anything but a prince." The queen and her son made Fifine and her white mare welcome. Fifine liked him from the start, but she remembered the white mare's warning and said nothing of her true identity. Several weeks passed, and one day the prince told his mother, I had the strangest dream. I dreamed that our visitor was a princess. How odd, the queen exclaimed. Let us test this. Take our guest to the market. If he really is she, our guest will surely stop at the jewelry stall. But Fifine, guessing at the trick, passed right by the jewelry stall and went straight to the stall selling knives and swords. That night, the prince once more dreamed that their guest was a princess. We shall try a bit of magic, the queen told him. She knew just one small spell. Take our guest to the orchard. If this truly is a girl, the apple blossoms will fall on her. But as the apple blossoms fell, the white mare blew them aside. They all landed on the prince. So much for magic, the queen laughed. That night, she slipped into the guest room where Fifine slept and caught Fifine asleep in a silken gown. So you are a princess, the queen cried. How clever you were to keep yourself disguised, but you are safe here. Take a look at, this is a picture of Fifine and the white mare and the prince. In the days that followed, the prince and princess walked together and talked together. They fell in love. 
and at last they married. This is as it should be, the white mare said. You will not need me for seven years, but you must always keep this magic flute with you. When danger arises, play it and I will come to you. With that, the white mare galloped away. For seven years, Fifine and her husband lived happily together and had two children whom they loved dearly. But one day the prince had to leave on a royal journey. Since their children were still too young to travel, Fifine stayed behind. She was with them in the palace garden when the earth shook and tore itself open. Up rose the golden prince, free after his seven years' imprisonment. Come with me, Fifine, he snarled, or I shall slay your children. Fifine hugged her children to her. You shall not hurt them, but before I go with you, you shall not hurt them, but before I go with you, first, you must let me play a little farewell tune on my flute. The golden prince shrugged. If it's brief, indeed it was, for it was the very first note when the white mare came galloping into the garden, fire blazing from her eyes. I did not know the right magic seven years ago, she said, cried, but after seven years I've learned it. Before the golden prince could say a word, the white mare stamped on the ground once, twice, thrice, three mighty blows that shook the earth. Earth, the white mare cried, here is evil. Earth, swallow him up. Earth, keep him forever. The earth tore open under the golden prince's feet. Shouting with rage, he fell into the pit. Without a sound, the earth closed once more, and the golden prince was never to be seen again. Now you are truly safe, the white mare told Fifine, and I may at last go home. She stamped her foot and a beautiful fountain sprang up. As Fifine and her children marveled at it, the white mare leaped up into the air and flew away. Fifine's husband soon came home from his journey. The family lived long and happily and they will never forget the white mare. Look at that beautiful illustration. Okay. What did you think of that story? I want to know what you're thinking. Send me an email and let me know which has been your favorite story so far and why. I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.